Good afternoon. Uh, you're very welcome uh, to this session with uh, Geraint Davis, uh, who had a very distinguished career in journalism, firstly in print journalism with the Western Mail, afterwards with uh, ITV, and afterwards uh, with the BBC Wales. Um, he's also played, I think, a, a very big role in public society, uh, especially in the area of, of culture. In the, the Welsh Opera House, for example, he's a, a very important figure, and in National Gallery in Wales and so on. Um, he's going to talk to us about Wales and about the, how Europe is perceived in Wales, uh, and about the relationship perhaps between Wales and uh, their big bear of a neighbour. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure to introduce you, Geraint. Uh, the, the, it'll be the usual thing. The initial presentation is on the record, chat and mouse rule, uh, and then the question and answer is off the record. And I'm told that we have to finish by two o'clock so that everybody can get back to whatever business they're engaged in before the storm comes in. Please. There we are. Dai, uh, many, many thanks to you uh, um, uh, for that and for the, uh, the, the chance to, uh, to address you today. I, I'm very grateful because uh, Dai, he came to Cardiff um, some months ago and uh, delivered um, an extremely uh, powerful address in Cardiff you know, on the, uh, the European issue. Um, and uh, reminded us all, I think, of uh, a slight tendency to British amnesia uh, about some of the difficulties we've created in this island. And I think that was a, um, a chastening address for uh, many who were there. Um, it's, uh, I think, almost 20 years since I was last uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this building, and it's a real pleasure to be here again. Um, uh, I think it's true to say that... Um, that uh, Welsh people have a, a, a fellow feeling for Ireland, uh, which is uh, very special, uh, and um, uh, I, I hope I won't offend any Scottish friends when uh, I say that it's, um, it, it's maybe even deeper uh, than the feeling we have for, um, uh, uh, for Scotland. Uh, and it's not just, I think, that you are um, uh, physically closer. Um, on a personal note, my... Uh, Parents uh, spent their honeymoon in Dublin uh, in uh, the 1930s and were photographed on top of a column that no longer exists. <laughs> um, and I've always taken uh, pride in the fact that uh, my, uh, my father um, was the author of the first critical study uh, in the Welsh language of uh, James Joyce. Um, and so I've had the privilege of having uh, uh, many friends uh, uh, here in Ireland, north and south of the border, uh, not least the, uh, the late and wonderful Sean, Sean McRaymond, um, uh, with whom a very long lunch was always too short, um, but um, a, a wonderful man. Um, and when I was at the BBC in the 90s, um, we had a, a fantastic privilege of inviting Michael D. Higgins to deliver the annual BBC Wales radio lecture. So, there's been a, a lot of sort of uh, uh, interplay with Ireland. And back in 99, I came here just as the um, National Assembly was actually being set up, the beginnings of devolution. I came here with a colleague um, uh, from a Welsh think tank, the Institute of Welsh Affairs. Uh, we spent some time with um, uh, Brendan Halligan, who uh, is known to uh, many of you. And um, I've never forgotten what um, uh, Brendan uh, said to us as we embarked on devolution. Well, he said, if you can't be big, you better be smart. Uh, and I'm not quite sure whether we've actually lived up to, <laughs> uh, um, to, uh, to that, but um, uh, maybe that's uh, another talk. Um, uh, I've always thought of myself as uh, a Welsh European, um, uh, oddly, uh, because when uh, I was at university at Oxford and as an undergraduate, uh, listened to Edward Heath speaking in the mid-60s. Uh, and uh, I think that was, uh, I think, the first time I started to be conscious of the, um, uh, of the whole European um, uh, dimension. Um, and I think the real clincher has come for me in the last few years when um, 
Uh, my eldest son married a woman from Copenhagen, uh, and immediately after the referendum, they took their two children to uh, Copenhagen and they became Danish citizens. So we are now a, um, a truly uh, a European uh, uh, family. Um, uh, I've uh, this summer sort of published um, uh, a book really on um, uh, on the Brexit issue from uh, the Welsh um, uh, angle. Uh, it's really a collection of various things I've been writing over over recent years, but it also um, uh, takes in, I think, the way in which uh, Europe has Im impacted on me, and includes such things as you know essays on uh, Auschwitz and on a uh, visit to a BMW factory in uh, Munich, uh, on um, the experience of the European Cup final in Cardiff. Um, and indeed, a, a, a chapter on uh, the event that uh, he took part in in, in, uh, in Cardiff. I don't claim to speak for Wales, but I do speak for a growing um, number of people uh, across the whole of Wales who are working tirelessly uh, to try and reverse the decision that was taken in um, uh, 2016. Um, why? Um, Essentially, because uh, civil society in Wales, I think, has really relished our membership of the European Union. It's allowed Wales uh, room to breathe, um, and it's also allowed us to reach out to Europe on our own terms, uh, I think, without having everything mediated through London. Uh, and uh, I would hope and guess that um, Irish people, uh, of all people, um, uh, will understand um, uh, the advantages of that. Uh, many of us, uh, during the 2016 campaign, um, bemoaned the lack of emotion and idealism uh, uh, in the 2016 campaign. It was, in my view, drearily uh, transactional. Um, and I can tell you uh, that uh, that was certainly something many of us regretted at the time. Uh, and I must say that as time has gone on, uh, I think some of us uh, feel um, uh, as emotional as ever you know, on this issue. You know, I do weep sometimes, actually, to see um, one's own country being uh, mocked in the world. I weep when I see our closest allies, I think, um, uh, for half a century being completely bewildered by our actions. Uh, I weep too when I see British politicians uh, being shockingly cavalier about peace in, uh, in Northern Ireland and talking about the Good Friday Agreement as if it was just another piece of paper. Um, and most of all, of course, um, uh, I really feel, particularly for those communities uh, in Wales who have suffered decades of neglect, um, and uh, I think that they face the prospect last. Uh, not of more of the same, but possibly even worse, and that is a, a cause of real concern. Uh, when I look around me at the minute, I see only one um, silver lining, it's an important one, and I think it's a strange uh, paradox. Um, while I was deeply, deeply depressed by the result in 2016, I have to say uh, I am encouraged by one thing now. The truth is, and it's a great irony, um, that I do not remember ever before in my life this much enthusiasm in Britain for the European cause. Uh, even in the 1975 referendum, never before have so many British people been as acutely conscious of the benefits of our membership of the European Union, economic, social, cultural, even, even psychological. Um, yes, many Many took it for granted for too long. Uh, you can argue that we woke up too late, uh, but what I will say, by God, we are awake now. And um, uh, I hope you will see evidence of that on the streets of London um, a week tomorrow, uh, when uh, there is a, a very major demonstration uh, being planned. Uh, but obviously the issue is, is it too late? Um, and uh, before answering that question, um, I want to just step back to 2016 for a minute um, and answer uh, that question really from a Welsh perspective. Why did Wales, um, the part of the UK that's benefited more from EU funding than any other UK region save for Northern Ireland, 
Why did it vote the same way as Scotland and Northern Ireland? Why, with Welsh industrial exports to Europe being disproportionately <coughs> higher than uh, in England and Scotland, did we not simply vote our pockets? I mean, something like half of, uh, of um, UK exports uh, go to the EU. Uh, in Wales, the figure is two-thirds. Uh, why did Welsh farmers, dependent on the EU for 80% of their income and more than 90% uh, of their agricultural exports, why did they, frankly, prefer to grumble about paperwork? Um, and why were Welsh universities twice as dependent on EU Horizon 2020 research funding as universities in England? Um, why were they actually not more vocal? And the final question, really, was why, 20 years after the advent of democratic devolution and the creation for the first time in modern history of a distinctive Welsh polity, did Wales follow the English lead? You know, is Wales now more like England than ever? Um, are we reverting to that infamous 19th century Encyclopedia Britannica entry for Wales, see England. Um, um, I, I, um, uh, I don't believe so. I think if Welsh identity survived the British Empire uh, and a few world wars, uh, I think it will survive these disjointed times uh, as well as some de demographic challenges that I will uh, uh, come to. But I first, I, I just, uh, you'll forgive me if I, I give you some, some hard uh, uh, data which may surprise. Um, Put Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, uh, on one side for a minute. I know that's a fairly big exception, but let's deal with England and Wales. Um, across England and Wales, Wales scored the lowest leave vote um, of any region outside London and the South East. Uh, the uh, leave vote in Wales was 52.5%. The Welsh capital, Cardiff, recorded a marginally higher vote for Remain than London. Um, across the whole of Wales, a country of 3 million people, um, the leave majority was only 82,000. Um, and this was in circumstances where we had had elections to the National Assembly only a matter of weeks uh, uh, earlier. And looking back, uh, uh, it was quite unrealistic to expect parties that had spent 18 months knocking chunks out of each other in the run-up to the Assembly elections to expect them to turn on a sixpence and link arms. Um, you know, it, 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 didn't, it wasn't going to happen, and I think it didn't happen. And it made the early cross-party planning of a referendum campaign absolutely impossible. Uh, I mean, frankly, once the Assembly elections were over, we struggled to get party workers out onto the streets because you know they were they were tired and exhausted, um, uh, and there were other problems. I, I can recall because because I, I was chairing the advisory um, uh, uh, group in Wales, uh, we tried to get a cross-party launch of the referendum campaign together in the week immediately following the assembly elections, uh, and we had to call it off because the first minister. I had to travel to Delhi because of the crisis over the steelworks of Port Talbot, the, uh, the Tata steelworks. Um, we had other problems. Uh, um, the lack of indigenous newspapers uh, meant that it was a, a real struggle to get some of the arguments home. Uh, we also had a problem with the uh, Charity Commission. The Charity Commission decided that um, if civil society organisations got it, involved in any way in the campaign, they might jeopardise their charitable status. And this was quite unlike the referendum in 2011 on legislative powers for the National Assembly. So, in effect, civil society in Wales was just put in a box by the Charity Commission. And I think some of us are taking steps to try and ensure that if there is another referendum, uh, that that actually doesn't, um, uh, doesn't happen again. Um, I think this was all... Frankly, um, another measure of David Cameron's carelessness, because it's not just hindsight. Um, many of us, you know, and a lot of politicians warned him against the overlap of the referendum with the assembly elections, and uh, frankly, everybody was just waved away. Now, um, th that was some of the background of the campaign. As for the, 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 the vote in Wales, a quarter of the total votes cast in Wales 
were accounted for by the South Wales Valleys constituencies that had been described as the largest area of multiple deprivation in Europe. If ever there was a left behind area, um, uh, this is it. Um, the per capita GVA of West Wales and the Valleys, which is the, uh, uh, was it, I'm not sure if it's nuts one or nuts two, sort of in, uh, in European uh, jargon. But uh, the per capita GDP of, of West Wales and the Valleys is 64% of the UK average. The sense of deprivation is substantial and it's an unconscionably long standing. Uh, I mean, it's been there for um, certainly uh, um, for the whole of my life, and arguably you can actually trace it back uh, over the last century, really, from the uh, recession at the end of the, uh, of the First World War. Um, and yet, that 52% leave vote in Wales was substantially lower than in the Midlands of England, which was 59%, or the northeast of England, a comparable region to Wales, at 58%. The Leave vote in Wales was only 0.7% higher than the, uh, than the south-east of England. Um, and I do think that this uh, result seems all the more remarkable when you uh, take into account that of the four territories of the United Kingdom, Wales is unique in the scale of change in its population base. Um, the simple result of uh, presenting England uh, uh, with our long <coughs> flank. And the contrast is often made that the Scots present England with a, um, a short neck, uh, uh, Wales presents it uh, uh, with a long flank. And, and this is some of the data, right? In, in Northern Ireland, 91% of people were born in Northern Ireland. In England, 88% were born in England. In Scotland, the figure is 81%. The figure in Wales is 57%. It's absolutely adrift uh, um, in, in, from the other nations of, of the UK. And this is despite, um, you know, despite much higher levels of, sort of immigration from outside the UK um, uh, in England. Now, I don't want to draw any crude or, or distasteful conclusions from uh, such data. After all, um, Walls are, uh, are generally undesirable things, whether they're in Berlin or in Gaza or in Belfast. Uh, 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 Offers Dyke, I'm glad to say, is now a very, very pleasant walk. Um, but uh, it, rather it's to say that in terms of identity, uh, Wales is the most complex of the territories of the UK. Um, uh, the, the changes, the, the, uh, the last census, I think, there were 507 people, um, 507,000 people um, uh, claiming to be Welsh living in England, and there were 636,000 people claiming to be English living in Wales. You know, there's a big, big swap. Uh, um, uh, something close on two thirds of the Welsh population live within 25 miles of the, uh, of the English border. Uh, so there's a, a huge sort of uh, interpenetration there. Um, and it, that creates its difficulties. Um, uh, it doesn't help, really, in a situation where, as uh, one, or one English author, um, David Goodhart, a former editor of Prospect magazine, who admitted that the, the English remain semi-literate in the language of modern identity. Um, but um, no doubt that's something that you... <laughs> might want to uh, uh, debate. Um, but for all these reasons, that is why, in my mind, um, devolution is so important. Um, and why it's uh, so important that Brexit doesn't become a means to erode the civic advance that's actually been uh, achieved in Wales since 1999, uh, since the creation of the National Assembly. Um, uh, and I say that because you know, if, if Welsh national identity is to survive, it has to be in the context of citizenship that is uh, uh, open to uh, uh, open to all. And uh, that threat to devolution, I think, uh, is of real concern to a lot of people in Wales. Uh, I confess that during the Scottish independence referendum in 2014. Uh, like many people in Wales, I shuddered at the thought of what the backlash might be uh, were Scotland to uh, uh, leave the Union. Um, yes, we could have had a lot of fun 
um, contemplating a name for the, the rump UK, you know. Uh, suggestions were made of Little Britain or, um, uh, or uh, Greater England um, uh, or you could have had fun redesigning the Union Jack to take out the saltire and insert the uh, cross of St David's um, but the truth is we would have then, Wales would then have been in a union in which England comprised 92% of the population um, we would have had to deal with a very large elephant on our doorstep uh, and one suffering, I think, from the ha had Scotland uh, voted independent, that elephant would have been suffering, I think, an even bigger trauma than that occasioned uh, uh, by the loss of uh, empire. I think traumatised elephants are unpredictable. Um, uh, well, maybe not quite, um, um, because in a way, uh, you can get... Um, more than a hint of what the consequences would have been by looking at the responses of Westminster and Whitehall to the devolution process uh, and to the consequences of Brexit for that process. Um, I can recall a, a, a decade ago when Wales was demanding a constitutional settlement uh, akin to that of Scotland. Uh, just to explain that the, the difference between Wales and Scotland in, in 1909 uh, the Scots, uh, all powers were transferred to Scotland, save for some reserved powers that were uh, retained to Westminster. Uh, in Wales, uh, it was the other way around. We only got conferred powers, and everything else by default remained at Westminster. So uh, we had a system uh, based on endless chapters of conferred powers, whereas Scotland had a, just a shorter list of, of reserved powers. Um, the truth is, I think, that, that Whitehall can just about get its head around uh, uh, Scotland, um, but it seems constantly bemused uh, by Wales, uh, much as if it were being asked to sort of negotiate with Rutland. Um, uh, it's, a it's a response, I think, um, Whitehall's response a decade ago, when the issue of legislative powers came up for, um, for the uh, National Assembly in Wales, the Whitehall response was to publish a list of powers that it wished to reserve to London. The list ran to 146 pages and covered 200 policy areas. It was, in effect, a massive pile of do not disturb signs. Um, much of it, I'm glad to say, was rejected. But in a way, um, Whitehall had given the game away. And, the, and I think that's one of the reasons why many people are nervous, to say the least, uh, fear the uh, initial repatriation of powers from the EU to London rather than to the de devolved administration, albeit uh, for a, a limited period of, uh, uh, of, of seven years. Um, it's also why we fear the replacement of EU funding um, uh, based on an objective calculation of need uh, rather than opaque uh, background, uh, backroom deals. Because um, the real difficulty we have with the devolution settlement in, uh, uh, in the UK is, is that most of the Whitehall departments are party pre. For the most part, their ministers are, under the status quo, ministers for England. So to give them now, post-Brexit, free reign to exercise a centralising instinct uh, on England from uh, uh, Monday to Thursday uh, and then ask them to exercise a, uh, uh, to be in enlightened decentralisers um, uh, in relation to Scotland, Wales and Ireland on a Friday afternoon uh, is really to ask the impossible and I think it's the triumph really of, of hope over experience. Um, and I'm afraid to say that in that situation my concern is uh, that Wales is the place that might suffer most because it's been unable to develop any serious uh, leverage um, uh, you know, for obvious historical and political reasons. Let's take public expenditure per head as a proxy measure of leverage. The per capita spend in Northern Ireland is 19% above the UK average. Uh, that's the figure before the special funding that the DUP uh, managed to negotiate. 
In Scotland, it is 13% above the UK average. In Wales, it is 4.4% uh, uh, above the uh, average. And these figures um, bear little relationship to uh, uh, objective need. Although I, 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 um, I say that, you know, in saying that, I, I hasten to say that I don't want to belittle in any way the real contribution that funding, both from the EU and the UK, has made to peace in, uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, I, I, I'll come back to the Welsh economy maybe uh, uh, over questions because I'm keeping a, a, an eye on the clock. But um, let me just cut to the chase. Um, uh, two years on, you know, has anything changed? Uh, uh, and again, uh, some statistics that may be of use. Um, uh, a recent YouGov poll in Wales, sample of a thousand done in August. Um, there has been a swing to remain, but not a large one. It's now 51.49 for remain overall. Although age is the starkest differentiator, um, Amongst the under 50s in Wales, it's a slam dunk for Remain. Uh, 73% of Welsh 18 to 24 year olds and 58% of 25 to 49 year olds would vote Remain. And Labour voters in Wales break the same way, 76 24. Um, so, you know, there is a real base of, uh, of, of, um, uh, of support uh, there. Um, and beneath that 51.49, I mean, I, 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 you know, I wish it was bigger, but, but you know, that's where we are. But beneath that 51.49 um, top line, there is a, a real pit of disillusion. 82% believe the Brexit process has been a mess. 73% believe that Brexit promises will be broken. 64% blame the government. And twice as many believe that Brexit will make Wales economically weaker rather than stronger. That's 45% against 22. Only 16% think we will get a good deal at the end of it all. Um, uh, and then support for a second referendum stands at 44% with 36% opposing. Um, now, my conclusion to this is what we are seeing below a, a carapace of nervy fatalism uh, is a deep pessimism and I cannot believe uh, that that carapace will never crack. I think the issue is whether it will crack in, in, in good enough time. Uh, the most likely explanation I think for the inconsistency between the top line figure and the underlying data is that many have tuned out and who can blame them? Um, the arguments must seem very arcane I think uh, um, uh, for the public and, and sometimes even for those, who, those of us who are trying to keep up it's just not realistic to expect the mass of the public, you know, we all have our lives to live to ferret around to discover the difference between a customs union the customs union or a customs arrangement and I challenge any of you succinctly and in words of no more than three syllables and without hesitation or deviation <laughs> to explain the differing implications of being a member of or having access to or participating in a single market or the distinction between a transition period and an implementation period. Although I think even the British <coughs> government has now stopped using um, the term implementation period. Um, you know, this must seem to a lot of people um, uh, like medieval theologians arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. And it's no wonder that the public opinion seems not to shift. Um, uh, even Keir Starmer uh, um, looks to me uh, many times as if he's about to burst into tears. But, you know, with that I can sympathise. Um, so what happens next? Um, uh, frankly, your guess is as good as mine. There are more permutations... Uh, on the table uh, than uh, I've had do or dinners. Um, will both sides reconcile the seemingly irreconcilable? Uh, will we do right by Ireland? Um, are the optimistic noises from Brussels grounded in substance or are they merely tactical, setting up a, a stance of mystification, you know, um, uh, less talks collapse? Uh, will we end up with a blind Brexit or a stealth Brexit? 
Uh, if, there's any, if there is an agreement, uh, I've no doubt that Mrs. May will extol its breath, breadth and other virtues, but it is bound to be less than the status quo. And I, for one, cannot see how anything can pass the, uh, the six tests that Keir Starmer uh, set out for Labour. Uh, I, I would have thought that Labour would have to vote against it. Um, if the deal gets through a meaningful vote, uh, my guess is there could soon be a degree of public incomprehension and exasperation when they realised this is actually not even the end of the beginning. Um, and what happens if the deal is voted down? Uh, can it really be further negotiation? Um, just think about it. The notion that a meaningful vote would send a PM who cannot command the House back to the negotiating table is, in my view, risible. Uh, faced with the prospect of Brexit falling apart, why would the uh, EU make further concessions to facilitate an outcome it has never desired? How could anyone on either side know what concessions would make a difference? And to whom would the EU make those concessions? Now, I I'm sure you will say, uh, uh, as many have said to me, you know, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. Um, but what then? Um, we could be faced with a government whose authority is even more shot than now, having lost its central policy and the most important parliamentary vote in half a century and more. And uh, you, know, you can argue that in those circumstances, if a government were not to resign, then, uh, you know, frankly, all honour dies. And what are the Labour Party? <coughs> Labour, above all, uh, I think it, it, uh, it has to be prepared for that moment. And the right answer, in my view, is not the crab-like movement we've seen over the last uh, two years. Um, uh, let's face it, I think uh, constructive ambiguity uh, has not worked. If it, if it were delivering a 20-point lead for Labour in the opinion polls, one might have to bow to the tactical genius of its leaders, uh, but it's not. Um, not only did the party not win the last general election, but it's currently points behind uh, one of the most disastrous governments, I think your phrase last night uh, was since Lord North lost the American colonies. Uh, uh, but perhaps you were quoting somebody else. <laughs> um, I do wish the, uh, the Labour leaders of Labour, you know, the party of internationalism, had the courage to change the narrative and to take a, a, a much bolder stance. And I think in this context, because one has this argument constantly at home, one's got to lay one canard to rest. Um, to uh, oppose Brexit you know, is not to disrespect the result of the referendum, either in Wales or in the UK. The greatest respect one can show to that result is to understand what lies behind it and the pain that propelled many communities towards their decision. It's to respect the suffering, I think, of those communities, suffering that they've endured for far too long, and frankly, to fear its prolonging. Uh, I think that uh, uh, if I were uh, advising the Labour Party, uh, um, uh, and there are more than enough advising them, uh, both parties, are, well, Labour certainly needs to say, I think, we understand your pain, we are as angry as you are, but if you want us to change your lives, we're not only going to need Europe's help, we're going to need to change Europe too and not run away from it. Um, I watched uh, uh, Judella uh, Stewart's uh, address to uh, this institute uh, the other week uh, when she said to you there were unresolved issues around the Eurozone, around the UK Constitution uh, and on immigration, and I agree with her. But the answer does not lie in turning our backs uh, on, the, um, uh, uh, on the EU. Um, the strange thing, and I've got a lot of sympathy with the Labour manifesto, uh, um, the British Labour Party's manifesto for, for reform. And the odd thing is that if I had to choose one word to describe that programme, it would be European. Uh, it would be a French-like approach to public utilities. It would be a German-like approach uh, uh, to uh, industrial structures uh, and, to, uh, uh, and to investment. Uh, so I can't understand why they do that. And my last point is this, because I know I'm keeping an eye on the time. If this year we confirm 
a decision to leave one of the noblest confederations in the history of the world in order to fidget on the fringes of everywhere, I think we will have betrayed the children and the grandchildren of us all. We will have shrunk uh, the garden in which we toil and play and against the express wishes of those younger uh, people. We will have resurrected unnecessary borders uh, on our shores and in our minds, and I think we will have raised a tariff against neighbourliness, uh, not least even against our Celtic cousins. And that's why I think more and more of us are demanding a new people's vote in which we will at least have a wholly new understanding of our real circumstances. There will certainly be risks in that uh, course, but at present uh, I uh, see no alternative. And if you like, uh, this is uh, still, thank God, unfinished business. Thank you. Thank you very much.